Well, here we are again. We made it. Uh, let's see if I get all my ducks in a row here. Yeah, so anyway, live from Miami Beach, here we are again. Uh, our tourists won't leave. <laughs> we're on the inside, we're crying. So they just won't leave. I don't know why. I think it got in the news that that uh, this that Miami Beach was anything goes, <laughs> and and it sure looks like that. So anyway, we're hoping they're all kind of get the hell out of town here in the next little bit. Uh, so update: uh, I only lost a half a pound this week. I'm really pissed about that. But that's uh, so I'll do carb cycling, which means that I will uh, I will change to one one meal will just be carbohydrate, and then I'll go back to low carb or zero carb is what I usually do. So 30 pounds down. Got another 15 to go, so keep me honest. But I did have to tell you, it's only half a pound. I'm pissed about that. But I do have new jeans, and I also have a different shirt, so that's different. Uh, but that's not what you came here for. That's just for my updates to you. Um, the next class we have in uh, Palo Alto will be in, uh, in August. Yeah, carb loading is what it's called, right? Uh, and so we classrooms open now, which is really good. They're open both here in Miami and there, so that's kind of kind of good getting that all uh, streamed back up again. And uh, let's see, the next class we have is gonna be July. I forgot the exact date. Well, at the end of it, I'll tell you, but we have uh, some availability in that. So that's gonna be live in Miami and also online. We do a lot of that, you know, remote learning. It seems to, seems to work out pretty well. And then it does cost a lot, it cuts a lot of cost if you're not gonna fly with us. If you're flying with us, it kind of makes sense to come because then you can, um, uh, you, you fly in the morning. Right, so so you sort of get that out, out the system. All right, so today what I want to talk about is that aerodynamics. It's, it's one of those subjects that we've talked about it before, but it's one of those subjects that people struggle with all the time. And the reason people struggle with it, I think, is because they try to complicate it and they try to make it uh, aeronautical engineering. And I'm here to tell you that in the airplane flying handbook and the PHAC, pilot's handbook of aeronautical knowledge, and every other AC that's put out by uh, the FAA, they're not interested in aeronautical engineering in that side of in a pilot training. Because the, the whole reason we want to understand about aerodynamics is not to be aeronautical engineers. The reason we want to understand about aeronautics, aerodynamics is to be able to understand what's happening in an airplane and actually be able to anticipate what might be dangerous, counterintuitive. There's a lot of things that are, that are counterintuitive, in, in particular with, AV, with uh, aerodynamics. So I had a 15-year-old student named Zach once who uh, was just doing flight training. And that's all I kind of want to do. 15 is kind of all you really want to do, right? You want to do more schoolwork. And then he actually attended our private pilot class. And at the, at the part of the aerodynamics, he went, he said, I was such a fool. As a 15-year-old kid, he said, I was such a fool. He said, for flying this airplane, I really couldn't solo. He says, and not understanding what I was doing. He said, I had no, I, I was just manipulating these controls. I don't know what, the, you know, I really didn't understand it. He says, and now I understand that certain things I was thinking about even doing might have even been dangerous. Now, this is from a 15 year old kid, right? Who's quite brilliant, I might add. Goes to USC now. Uh, so, this is why we want to understand aerodynamics. And we want to understand it in such a way that it can be meaningful to us, meaning that, that, uh, that we have to be able to use the principles that are there. Whether they're 100%, 1,000% correct, you know, uh, it almost doesn't matter. What matters is that we latch on to a, a way of teaching or, or these tools in such a way that, that we don't get ourselves in trouble, right? And we understand what's going on. So that's where we're going to start with that. So uh, what I'm going to tell you is all true, but, uh, but it's, like, it's like when we teach, uh, so I taught electrical engineering, these, this kind of thing, right? Basic electricity, all that sort of stuff. And we use... Uh, a water analogy that that kind of works for us, right? Like there's a pump and that's electromotive force pressure, right? Then we talk about the water, that's current. And we talk about a spigot or a faucet, that's resistance. And so we can kind of tie those things together. And in a lot of ways with aerodynamics, we have similar things that uh, that we can sort of latch onto that, that work for us at subsonic speeds. When we talk about supersonic speeds or, or, or that above Mach 1, then we have to talk about compressibility and all sorts of other stuff that's, that's kind of way out of the scope of what we want to do. So now we would just consider air to be uh, non-compressible. So, but as we get farther up in speed, we got to talk about things differently. That's different. So, so okay, so what we're going to do on that is I'm going to start off with just basically the way I do this in our CFI class. So what I'd like to do is uh, 
talk about, um, bring up iPad, the iPad here with the pencil. Just one second, get the thing going. Take me just a second. It's been on the charger, so it's good now. And that's what I use in class as well. I use an iPad with something called PDF Expert. And uh, then I share it with everybody. So everybody sees the same thing. So if you're ever in one of our classes, whatever you see it on, if you're in person, you see it on a 65 inch monitor. I don't use a whiteboard. Uh, and uh, the people at home see the exact same image. So in, in the same resolution. So that is by design. So I'll show you kind of what it looks like. So I'm gonna look at it like this. And then I'm gonna use this little app here called PDF Expert, which is this thing. And I just use it as a whiteboard. So, uh, so what I wanna do is, is just begin by saying that what we have to do is in order for an airplane to fly, we have to overcome its weight, right? I think we kind of understand that. And so if I have a, like an airplane that's here and it weighs 3000 pounds, I have to generate an opposing force of 3,000 pounds for the airplane not to accelerate and stay where it's at. If I can't generate that, this airplane is not going to fly, right? So that's the first fundamental thing we have to understand. So this force is weight, of course, and this is uh, in aviation terms called lift. So then it's the matter is weight is already taken care of, right? We don't have to worry about that. Whatever the airplane weighs, you weigh whatever you put in it, that's, that's force of gravity downward. That's it. But lift is something we have to generate. And so how do we generate lift is the first question. So there are two general forms of doing that. And I'm also going to scare you because I'm going to write the lift equation down, which you're really going to hate. Uh, but you'll love it because if you're a flight instructor, you use it all the time. It simplifies life for you. So I'll show it to you in a little bit. But uh, anyway, so, so, so the first thing is we can develop lift by just impact by pressure. So it means that if you take a, like a board or your hand out the, out the window of a car like that, and this board is going this way, if it's going that way, then the relative wind that it's experiencing or the, the, the wind in which it's going to encounter is going to be from this way, the opposite way, in exactly the same way that it's moving. So its flight path in this case, I would say, if I were like just saying what's its flight path, the flight path of this board is, is directly across the screen like that, right? And, but it's tilted up, right? It's not flat. So, but its flight path is that. And the flight path is a very important thing to understand. The flight path is the way something is going, not the way it's pointed. So the relative wind is always opposite to that, which is that black line. So what then happens is, of course, then we generate a force, right? So we get impact pressure into this board, bang, like a snooker board or a pool table, and the angle it comes in and angle it does, and the reactionary force is that way, right? Which then resolves into two little components. And the first one is some part of that goes up and some part of that goes back, right? So when you stick your hand out the window, uh, it doesn't go straight up, right? If you haven't noticed, right? The flight path is straight because you've got the, the, the car moving forward, but the, your hand actually goes up and it goes back. And if you have enough of that impact pressure or enough force, you can make anything fly. That's how come a toilet can fly if you want it to, a cow can fly, alligator. We had during the hurricane season here a few years ago, there was the alligators and, you know, they're not around here. You know, you look, if you come to Miami looking for an alligator, you're not going to find one. You find iguanas, but you don't find alligators. Why? There's not enough food here. They, they need a lot of food. So anyway, all of a sudden people find alligator in their backyard. Like what in the hell is going on? Well, that alligator got picked up and got moved over from somewhere because of this effect, right? It, it didn't generate lift on Bernoulli. It generated lift on impact pressure. So this is the first thing we can do. And this explains why a symmetrical airfoil one that doesn't have it has cameras equal on both sides can actually can actually work. So the other way we can generate lift is by uh, by principle, right? And it's just this. It's so back in the day. Uh, remember that in Europe, in the 15, 1600, 1700s, only the rich kids went to college, right? Uh, because they didn't have anything else to do. So they said, "Oh, you go off and go to college, right? We'll pay for all that." You know, family got a billion whatever or something, you go, you go think. And so the Renoulis were one of those, the Gausses, uh, all, all Euclid, you know, all these, all these people, all they had to do was just think. And so they went to, to college and they thought, 
uh, Michael Faraday comes to mind, a bunch of people. And so when they, so Bernoulli was, there was a bunch of them. The Swiss one, the Swiss Bernoulli uh, was the one that we tend to associate with something called Bernoulli's principle, which is an observation he made. And we use it in aviation. I'm gonna show you how it works here and just second along with a little cool little app that you can buy. And for those of you who are, who go to the app store and you see something that costs like five bucks and you freak out, stop doing that. Right, <laughs> really, really. Five dollars isn't a lot of money. Ten dollars isn't a lot of money. If it is, you're in the wrong business. This aviation stuff will, will bring you to your knees. So you know, when you go, if it looks like it's a, a good tool, and I'll also show you at some point. I've already shown the previous power of the stuff that we actually use. But when you go to the uh, to the app store and you're looking for this product, it's going to be called Wind Tunnel Pro, and uh, not not the free version. That one doesn't do anything. You want the paid version, but I'm, it'll, it'll actually show it to you. But let's take a look. So I'm going to draw a cylinder here, right? Let's do that. That thing going. Hello. So this is just a tube, garden hose. I don't know what you want to call it, whatever it is. And if you put water into this thing or air or whatever you want to put into it, if your expectation is that whatever you put in will actually come out at the other side, uh, if that's the idea, and there's going to be no toilet backed up here, right? In other words, the, there's not going to be no backup. It's everything you put in is going to be going out. That's mass flow, right? And what that means is Bernoulli made an observation, and his observation was if I measure the pressure and I measure the velocity and the temperature, those things will remain constant throughout this tube, so PVT. So if I measure the pressure, which is, this, uh, the, which is the force exerted sideways in the tube in this case, the velocity is the direction and the speed and the temperature, right? Those things are all related and they're proportional. Uh, well, they're, I'll show you PVT on the other side. So if I measure that, that, that same thing, result would be the same here, would be the same everywhere through the tube. And this was the first thing. And so then uh, the next thing we have to understand is what if I restrict the tube? All right, now, now we have a little different situation. So let me make a restriction in this tube with a different color. So it may be blue. Blue sound like, it's like a blue day today. Blue. Oh, for carb loading, by the way, I'm gonna go have a beer. <laughs> I'm gonna have a beer today. You know how long it's been since I had a beer? God, it's in February, right? Yeah. Uh, so, okay, now I'm restricting the tube. So now what happens is there's a restriction. And so this stuff that's entering, you know, whatever, whatever it is, is going to have to get through that restriction and get to the other side if I want the toilet not to back up, right? That's what I say. So what needs to happen is when this fluid gets to here, it's going to have to speed up through the restriction. That means its velocity is going to have to increase. And the relationship between PVT remains always the same. So that means in order for that to have happened, the pressure must have fallen. And we can talk about temperature, but temperature also falls. But that's really only useful when we talk about like carburation and other sorts of things. So we're kind of going to take the T out of it today. So and then finally, when we get over here, the uh, PV relationship will be the same, right? And so this means that if we put a restriction into something, that whatever water or whatever fluid needs to go through, there's going to have to speed up to do that, and it will cause a decrease of pressure. So this is Bernoulli's observation principle. And I think we can begin to see that uh, with this next little app I'm going to show you now. So let me go off that and go over here to our stuff and get onto that. And then I'm going to open up. Uh, I'm going to open up uh, an airflow. Not like getting all excited because you see that, right? Everybody always gets excited when they oh, what the hell is that? Uh, so this is a simulator, of course. And maybe you can see that the airfoil, in, in each case, this airfoil is going directly from the right-hand side of the screen to the left-hand side, or I don't know which, maybe it's oriented opposite to you, but it's basically going uh, non perpendicular to the top of the screen, right? It's going that way. And you can see that the air on the top is actually traveling faster than the air on the bottom. And the reason it's doing that is because it has a longer path, right? Uh, and so if I were to, um, to, to go back to my drawing then after you can kind of see this is happening. What happens if I could just make the hump steeper? So you see that this airfoil has uh, something called camber, right? So camber is the 
curvature of the wing. So it's on the bottom, it's kind of flat. But on the top, it's kind of curved, right? And it's that way for a reason. And the Cessna, Piper, all they use a cambered airfoil. Some aerobatic airplanes, like the Pitts, they don't have any camber. They're the same on both sides. So the air would not flow any differently on top of the wing. So that's why it flies equally good upside down. Whereas this airfoil is not going to fly very good upside down because it's going to want to generate lift downward now. So with this speed, with the air going over the top of the wing, it generates more low pressure on top of the wing than it does in the bottom. And that causes then a force uh, from, to be created from the bottom of the wing to the top of the wing. So let's go back to my little drawing first. I think it's worth like getting rid of this and then sort of we can see that restriction and kind of think of that as the, as the, uh, the, uh, the, the airfoil itself. And so let's do this, right? Let's draw another wing here. And we'll sort of draw it a little more three-dimensional, right? It's kind of like that. And so what you can see is that the, the wing is moving across, across the board this way. It's fine. And the air is then going across the board, across this wing like this. And it's moving at a faster speed than the bottom. Well, you can't see that would happen there. Let me reshare this. Give me one second. Just one second. And while we're at it, uh, we're reformatting all of our documents and they're kind of, if you have CFI gold or whatever, they kind of look like this now. So we're in the business of doing all that. I'm gonna close this app for a second because somehow it got corrupted there. And then we'll go back to it. I can always use the, the simulator, but it's better if I do it this way. See if that will work. Okay, let's give it a go here. All right. Uh, so here's the airfoil, right? And like that. And you see the wind that will go over top of it. And so what generates then is higher pressure on the bottom than lower pressure on the top. And so then there's a force, obviously it's gonna be generated upward through that because high wants to always feel low. If you don't believe that, then uh, like that's why we have wind because there's high pressure one place and low pressure somewhere else. Uh, a battery doesn't wanna stay charged. It wants to discharge, right? All those. Everything wants to be equal. That's the whole idea. So this is the force called lift. And if you can see, it's gonna be a function of how fast this air is traveling across the airfoil. That's the first thing. So I'm gonna to begin to write out the lift equation here for you, which is gonna scare you for a moment, some of you, but don't, don't fret. It actually comes out from a series of differential equations, which are kind of, lift is very complicated, but it can be simplified in, in a way that we can use it as a flight instructor, as a student. So lift, you want to calculate the lift on the wind, a wing, it's going to equal to rho, which is the air density. So air has particles and density to it, right? So means that uh, we're not living in space. So, uh, so we, we, we have particles and we have things that are in the way, right? Uh, and we have mass. So that's the air density. And as we go higher, we get less uh, and less dense. So the higher we go, the less density we have to work with. Therefore, lift is going to be harder to create, right? So we have that. And then we also have the square of the speed. So that's the speed uh, multiplied by itself. So that's a very efficient way of generating lift. The faster we can move, we can move air across the top of this wing, the more lift we get, and we get it quickly, right? And then we have the surface area of the wing, how big the wing is. Like you can see in my example here, this kind of a fat wing. You know, it's kind of biggish wing and the bigger I make it, the more lift I get out of it. There's consequence of that, which we'll say in a second. And finally, there's this other thing called CL. It's called coefficient of lift. 
And what it has to do with is two things. The, the first thing is the actual design of the airfoil. So the, yes, the surface area matters, but it also matters uh, what the wing shape is. And so that's part of it, but there's something else that CL means, which makes, makes us explain aerodynamics a lot easier to the student. It's called angle of attack, AOA. That's really what that is. So now I need to explain what that is because a student at this point would be confused and say, okay, I understand density. I understand the fact the speed, the surface area, but this AOA thing, I don't know what that means. So let's erase this and let's do something here. So I'm gonna label the parts of the wing. So here's a wing, just side view, right? And I'll draw a line from the leading edge to the trailing edge, which I'm sure you know this already. That's leading edge, trailing edge. This is the cord line. And then the curvature of the wing is called the camber. So the wing itself, and every example that I give, and, and I would encourage you to, uh, to, to always orient everything in this exact way, left to right, top down. Don't ever make, don't ever make that like heading 330. Right? Don't ever make this heading 275. Always make these things uh, relative to like north so the student can actually get what's happening, right? So they don't get confused in, the, in what you're trying to accomplish. So let's get rid of this thing and we'll go back to a pin. So the wing in all cases is going this way, right? Every case. It's just tilted a little bit. All right, and so then the relative wind in which this wing encounters is always opposite its flight path like that. So exactly opposite. So if I tilt the wing up more, if I decide to make the wing, I'm gonna make the wing now more tilted like that, angled up more, then it's still going, which way? It's still going always in our example that way. So the relative wind is always going to be opposite the flight path. And so now what I hope you see is that this is actually the angle of attack, the angle between the relative wind, its flight path and the cord line. And in this case, you can see that the air is gonna have to go across the top of the wing. I did it again. Yeah. Let's go back to our simulator. So the air is gonna have to go across the top of the wing. Right, and when it does so, if I were increasing the angle of attack and the airflow is still going the other, the same direction, look at the lift number that's down here. It's increasing. And it's increasing because I'm making the hump steeper, right? I'm actually making the path by which the air has to flow over top longer. And I can continue to do that. And the so the relationship then, if I, if I were to, let me I'll just go a little further. We can do that only to a point, though, because what will happen is we'll get to a point where the air can't uh, attach to the wing anymore. You can kind of see it happening a little bit off the back. You can kind of see that starting to burble back there. And this is the beginning of an aerodynamic stall, which at some point the air won't be able to attach and won't be able to generate any more lift by angle of attack. That'll be the end of it. In fact, you can see it happening kind of right there, right? That's what's happening. So now the airplane lift goes really, really, really down. So the only way for us to fix that is to change angle of attack, and lower it, basically what it is. All right. So let me go back to our uh, image here. Can do it. So that, that in, in essence is how we can generate lift. But so that, that's that part. Now I wanna talk about something else called drag. Drag's a pain, right? Because we have an atmosphere. So this is X, Y axis, by the way. I'm just gonna put drag over here. I'm gonna put speed here. And I just like to use simple terms because I find that students, uh, if you, if you say true airspeed or you say some, or whatever you put, you know, I, I think that they get confused in the terminology when we're just trying to explain something. Uh, no, it's not available on, only on the app store. So it's 10 bucks. Plunk it down, get it, you need it. Okay, so anyway, there's that. 
Uh, so I like to use simple terms. So let's talk about this. So the way I like to describe drag is, is in words, right? Uh, so I want you to think about your car and I want you to think about uh, driving your car and, and as you wanna go faster, you push down on your accelerator, right? And as you do that, what you're doing is you're causing the car to move uh, forward or back, whichever way you're going. But all those air particles that are out there that you can't see are in your way. And you, your car has to occupy that same space. It's got to move all that shit out of the way for you to be able to be in that new place. It's the same thing if you were chest high in a swimming pool and you're trying to run in a swimming pool. Well, that's going to be hard for you to do because you've got to displace all the water that's in your way to be in the space where you want to be because there's water there now. So that's even a more viscous, even a more dense atmosphere, right? So the idea is the faster you go, the more of these particles you got to move out of the way. And there'll be a point at which you don't have enough energy in your body or you don't have enough muscle power or you don't have enough horsepower or you don't have enough thrust, nice word, to overcome that drag right? You can't go any faster. And that's as fast as you can go, right? And so the other way of thinking about this is that, you know, energy can't be created nor destroyed, right? That's the basic concept. Uh, so when, when you, your body or your car has energy, and when you impart, you're banging into these molecules or these particles that are out there, you're imparting that energy into those molecules or those, those particles. You're taking some of your energy and you're giving it to them that had none before. And so then they can move out of the way, preferably, right? That's the idea. So then from here, you should be able to get the idea that the more streamlined we could make something, the less of that we'd have to worry about. So if we could make a razor thin wing, then wow, we could go pretty fast, maybe generate a lot of lift and not a lot of drag because the surface area, that the number of particles that we have to move out of the way ain't so much, right? And so, yeah, there are design compromises there. There are design compromises that have to do with, you know, the structure of the wing and various things, but that's the idea. So, and you can also imagine that we have to have a propeller. We have to have, uh, some airplanes need struts. Some airplanes got to have a place to put the engine. So there's a big nacelle in the front, you have cowling, right? And you, you've got to have pieces to make the airplane fly. So all those things are going to encounter uh, this, these particles. And the faster you go, the more of it you get. So it basically means that if this is zero drag, basically means that, that the faster I go, the more drag I get. And it goes up at the square of your speed. Now, does that really matter? No, you can just put the line down and say it just goes up. The faster you go, the, the, more, the more it goes. All right, but there's another thing that makes flying very counterintuitive, right? And it's called induced drag. And induced drag is something that every, Every CFI class I have, every one I, I teach, I always ask the student, what is induced drag? And they always tell me the same thing. They give me the FAA test question, which is what I think the FAA test knowledge test is a complete joke, right? It's not a test if you know all the test questions and answers, right? Like people say, I've already taken the FOI. Why? I say, what do you know about the FOI? Basically nothing, right? You memorized a bunch of things. And this is the same thing. So I say, what is induced drag? And they say, it's a byproduct of lift. And I'll say, well, what does that mean? And they'll say, I have no idea, right? So this is something that makes flying counterintuitive because here's something that we have to be able to get across to our student at some point. And, thing, and also our little uh, lift equation is gonna help us with this here in just a second, when we get a chance. But uh, think about this. If you wanna go faster in a car or a bicycle or whatever it is that's propelling you forward, uh, you pedal faster or you push down the accelerator and there'll be a point where you can't go any faster because you don't have enough horsepower. You don't have enough transmission to the tire to overcome the drag that you encounter, right? And that makes sense. And then if you say, we wanna go slower, I take my foot off that pedal and eventually I'll get down to speed zero. And that's kind of the way it works. But in an airplane, we have something interesting, right? If you wanna maintain the same altitude, this is only if you wanna maintain the same altitude, and you want to go faster, then you simply add throttle, just like a car. You stick the throttle in, and the more you stick the throttle in, the faster you go. But if you want to go slower, you pull the throttle out, and that makes sense too, just like a car. 
But there comes a point where if you're gonna go slower yet, you gotta push the throttle back in again, right? And sometimes it has to go all the way to full power again to go slow, to even go slower. And for students, this is very counterintuitive, right? Because it doesn't make any sense. And that's because of induced drag. And so that's the next thing that we need to approach. So let's look and see how that works. So what is induced drag? Okay, it's a byproduct of lift. Everybody can answer that FA test question, right? Let's get rid of this. I'll show you uh, two ways by which uh, you can do it. You can, you can see it. Looks like it loves me to make a new, new PDF each time. Okay, let's, let's let it happen then. All right, so uh, induced drag then is explained by, we can explain it by this. Put a pen down here. So in this particular case, it's not 100% right, but let's just say it is. Weight opposes lift. And again, if this is 3,000 pounds, then this is 3,000 pounds, the airplane stays where it's at. It doesn't climb, it doesn't descend, it doesn't accelerate in that direction, right? But when you start putting angle of attack on the wing, you start creating induced drag, right? And the reason you're creating induced drag is this reason. Let's tilt the wing up. Here's the cord line of the wing. Again, the wing is always going this way, right? Now what happens is weight still acting down, but total lift is acting now this way, right? And from our hand out of the car example, some part of that is holding us up, and some part of that is pulling us backward, and that is induced drag. So the part that's pulling us backward is contributing to total drag on, on, the, on the wing. The more we tilt the wing up, and we tilt the wing up, now we have more. You can see that the backward component gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's the first thing that we can explain. The other way we can explain it is maybe a little easier for people to understand maybe, but let's look at it. It has to do with wingtip vortices. So, which is also true. So let's put a wing down here. Here we have a wing and then we have air that's gonna flow over the wing you know that the high pressure on the bottom of the wing wants to get up to the low pressure on top of the wing. But it can't over here, right? Because there's no way for it to do it. The, the airflow is moving. But at the very end of the wing, the high pressure can try to get up to the low pressure in this, in this general direction, right? Can do that. Or the other way, whichever way it might go. And so it can actually get up to the low pressure. And so this creates a vortice. And of course, the air, the air is moving, the wing is moving, so it creates this big vortice, which washes out this part of the wing. And also that vortice didn't get created for free. It costs energy. That, that costs money to, to, to thrust. That costs something to generate those vortices. And so you don't get the vortices generated for free either. So the more angle of attack you have, the bigger the vortice, meaning the more energy you have to put into that, which means the less you have to go faster. So that's another way of thinking about induced drag. And so then when we put these things together, we do that finally. Let's do that. Let's put them together. Then we should have a curve that looks like this. Speed, drag. And if we combine, so that means that the, that the faster we go, the less induced drag we have because the angle of attack is low, right? But as we have to increase the hump and tilt that lift vector back, then it's gonna go like that until we get to the stalling speed. So when we add these two things together, then we end up with a curve that kind of looks like this. It looks like just a green line right there. So, Interesting, huh? Okay. It isn't like my eraser on the, <laughs> on the app today, but so I just make a new one each time. So that's our, that's our new curve. And so let's look at it now because I want to put some features on it. There's speed and there's drag. And so the overall curve now looks like that. Right, and so you can see there's a point where we have minimum drag, it's right there. That's the point where we have the lowest amount of drag. So uh, 
but we also now can kind of modify this a little bit because we haven't talked about thrust, but we can put that instead of drag over here on the side, we can sort of erase that. And we can just say, this is the percentage of power that we have available out of the engine. This is 100%, that's 100. This is like 40, 40%, I don't know, something like that. And of course, we do have a propeller and the propeller will allow us to generate some amount of power or thrust here on this side or power if we we'll talk about the other one. But so this is, if I label this, this is the power available, a power available. And this down here, this black part's the power required to stay level flight, to stay in level flight. So what should come out of this to you, what should be starting to be apparent is if I'm here at that speed right there, that's as fast as I can go because I don't have enough horsepower. Somehow I don't have enough power to overcome drag anymore. Also, I can't climb because I don't have any excess power. I can't do anything. All I can do is go this fast. And if I look here at this speed, this is as slow as I can go because I don't have any more available power to overcome the induced drag. And if you look in the middle here, this is the point where I need the absolute least power, right? This speed is the best glide speed. If I look at, like, I don't know, anywhere, like here, at this speed, I can go that fast and I can climb because I can use this excess power to climb on. And if I then finally look this whole curve and I say, what's the biggest gap? between the power that I need and the power that I have available, that's the best rate of climb speed because that will give me, I have the most power so I can climb, right? So, so that's where I have the highest uh, rate of climb. The angle is different. Well, that's, some, that's a different conversation that, that we'll have later. Uh, so the last thing that I wanna cover, and I think I've sort of beat that to death, is uh, the forces in a, in a climb and a descent and a turn, and then we'll end up on that. So I don't have enough time to cover stability, which we'll do that at a different time, but this is fundamental kind of concepts. So when you're climbing an airplane, when you climb, here's your airplane that's climbing, like my stick figure diagram, weight acts downward, right? And total reaction or lift, acts this way to the roof of your airplane. And some part of that holds you up. And some part pulls you back. And that's called the rearward component of lift that's actually acting rearward. And uh, according to Newton, of course, every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So what is the reaction then to this total lift? Well, that's the weight that opposes lift, which is here. And that's the same, whatever that number is, is the same number here. And there's a rearward component of that as well. Well, right, that's the rearward component of weight. And those two things, this one and that one, contribute basically to drag to slow you down, which is why when you climb, you will slow down if you don't add power. And it's the, the same is true with the descent. If you're in the descent, weight's still acting downward. But now there's a component of lift that's acting straight to the window or to the top of your roof, it's like that. And some part of that's holding you up and some parts acting forward. So you have a forward component of lift. And there's also, if this is a total lift, there's gotta be an opposing force, which is here. And that force then causes a forward component of weight, which then adds to the equivalent of thrust, which is why you speed up when you go down. Okay, so that's those two things. And now the last things. The last thing is the forces in a turn which seem to give people, I don't know, a hard time. One thing that people uh, tend to uh, not understand if they're not from a science background is uh, something called acceleration. Acceleration is, uh, can be a change of either uh, 
speed or direction, right? So when you're a straight level flight and you're at a constant speed, so meaning that your, uh, your, your speed is not changing and your flight path hasn't changed, so you're not changing the flight path and you're at the same altitude, you're not accelerating. So you're at 1G and you don't, if, if there were no noise or no turbulence, you wouldn't feel like anything was happening to you, right? So that's unaccelerated flight. But as soon as you change the flight path of the airplane, you notice there's G on the airplane, you feel it. Because you're changing the direction, you're accelerating it. Anytime you're turning an airplane, you're constantly accelerating it because the airplane's constantly changing direction, right? So anytime you're turning an airplane, you're gonna have acceleration on the airplane, right? So the forces in a, in a climb, or we already discussed, but the, the forces in a, uh, in a turn kind of look like this. So I put airplane is turning. Weight still acts down, right? Lift still acts that way. And then as the FA likes to say, this is the, hor the uh, vertical component of lift. And this is the horizontal component. And this is the force here that's actually causing the airplane to turn, right? Because it's the force that's being directed towards the inside of the turn. What's not being shown here are the opposing forces, right? And uh, I can also tell you that when you bank an airplane, as if, so first we had 3,000 pounds straight up opposing, opposing lift if we'd had unaccelerated flight. Uh, so 3,000, and this is 3,000. When we bank this airplane over and we don't change anything, this is still 3,000, right? That didn't change. But this number has got to be less than 3,000, right? It can't be 3,000 because that's the biggest part of the triangle. So in order for us to stay upright, to keep us level, we have to generate more lift so that we can make this number 3,000. Pretty. How is that? So we have to be able to make that number 3,000. And so, uh, oh yeah, so let's do that. I don't see that. All right. So we make that turn, whatever we're doing, there's weight, still 3,000. This number has to increase. It's, it can't be 3,000 anymore because you need that number to be 3,000 or the airplane's gonna descend, right? This number has to be 3,000. And you can see this is the longest line in the triangle, which is here. And so that's called the hypotenuse of the triangle and that's gotta be more. And if it were six degrees of bank, which you can show from uh, the P hack or other places, then uh, this number would turn out to be 6,000. You have to generate 6,000 pounds of lift in order for that number to be 3,000. So again, op now this is the horizontal component of lift, which is turning you, which we don't need to calculate. We could if we wanted to, but it doesn't really help us. But this force is really called centripetal force. It's, uh, it's centripetal, I think you call it here in this book, centripetal force. The force that balances it is centrifugal force, this one. CF, it's reactionary force to CP. So it's the force you feel like in a car when you go around a turn because you have force being directed towards a turn, but you're going the other way, right? It's Newton's third law again. But you also have a force that opposes that big old thing there, right? The big old lift you're generating. And that's the weight that opposes lift, which is called load factor. And it's also 6,000. And so what it means is that the wings have to generate 6,000 pounds of lift in order for you to maintain level flight if the airplane weighs 3,000 pounds. So therefore you put 2G on the airplane in that turn. If you skid or slip, then either this force is more or this force is more. Those forces need to be balanced. And uh, so then the last thing I would say before we conclude a little bit is that, uh, coordination. So this seems to be like, I'm going to turn off the screen share so we can just
talk about that briefly. So coordination. So, so what I want to say about coordination is I hear that word a lot, but I don't hear a lot of people really know what it, what it is. In England, it's called balance. You say the airplane's in balance or check your balance, right? Which seems to me uh, maybe makes more sense, less sense, but, but here's what it means. If this is the airplane, my pen, and it's got a nose and a tail, right? That's its uh, tip to tail. It's longitudinal axis. If that is constantly aligned with the flight path of the airplane, the airplane is coordinated. So the flight path is the way the airplane is going, not the way it's pointed, the way it's going. So if I'm going straight like this towards you, the flight path of this airplane is straight. And if my tip to tail is in line with the flight path, this airplane is coordinated, which means it's not slipping and not skidding. But what if so this happens? If I go like that and the airplane gets knocked off the side a little bit like that, but yet it's still going that way a little bit. Well, now it's tipped the tail, it's not aligned with its flight path, and it's going to, in this case, it's going to skid. So, uh, and in a turn, it will be the same thing. If you think about a turn, the flight path that's being described by the turn is a function of the bank angle and how much horizontal component of lift is in there. If, if, if the airplane's nose is pointed outside of that circle, that track, it's slipping, right? And its tip to tail is not aligned with the flight path. If you put too much rudder in the other way, then the nose tip to tail is inside of this flight path and it's skidding. So, and I find people have the hardest time with that. And then you say, well, how do I know? And most of you in the class, as soon as you say it, I wanna murder all of you who say it, you say, well, you look at the ball. And I say, well, if you have to look at the ball to see what to do, the yaw has already happened. You've already let it happen. So you're, you're putting a reaction to something you should have prevented in the first place, right? Under IFR, it's a little different. But under VFR, you can take that thing right out and throw it out the window, get rid of that thing, right? Because uh, it's not helping you. Step on the ball. Whoever said, I, I want to just crush that person who said that. I mean, if you have to step on the ball, it means you didn't know what to do in the first place, right? You let it happen. So the idea here is not to let it happen. So the way you not let it happen is this is how you have to do it. And except for, no, we're not talking aerobatics. We're talking about three cases. So if, in all cases that you're flying, transport or training, and you're doing any maneuver, you pick which one it is, unless you're doing a crosswind takeoff, a crosswind landing, or a slip of some kind, you should be straight up and you should not be moving left or right at all, right? If you're moving left or right in your seat, you're doing it wrong. That's how you know you're coordinated because that means C CF and C or centrifugal force and centrifugal force are balanced horizontal component lift and centrifugal force are balanced, right? The only way you're going to develop a sense for that is to give, is to try that and keep trying that. And then you don't need that ball anymore because the, the ball is, is just telling you, you've made a mistake. Now here's how to fix your mistake. Right. And I, and I think that's a terrible way to teach. So, I mean, it's okay to teach uh, subtle things. Now, again, we have sometimes underpowered airplanes. And so sometimes like in a turn, if like in a, a steep turn or whatever, you might glance at the thing and see, see if you're right or not. I mean, I'd probably give you a, a point for that. But if you had a 600 or 800 horsepower motor out there and you did it, you would know right away you're doing it wrong because the airplane would be slipping or skidding so hard that you would have no choice but to put in the correct rudder pressure. And you'd put it in there until you felt like you're straight up and down your seat. So that's what I have to say about coordination. Now we'll do another segment on aerodynamics, not this time. And what I'd like to cover is stability, how we get stability in the airplane. And we can talk uh, about um, some of the other uh, VA and how it changes the weight, why it changes the weight, and a few things like that. Uh, you're going to get a, uh, you get something from Nick. He's going to send you a, a, uh, a document. It's usually an outline, but it will send you a document. Uh, about Teach Brief Fly, which is our thing, which we have now. Also some uh, course information and whatnot. And I think that's kind of like what I need to say about it. I hope that it educated you. It gave you some insight into aerodynamics and, uh, and, and gave you a way to, to simplify it to the extent that you can. And I think now if you go back to the PHAC, Python Book of Aeronautical Knowledge, and you read that section, it starts to read a little bit better. 
I find the same thing with weather theory. If you or or the or the uh, what's the, the the other name for it? The weather theory and and well, weather theory that FOI fundamental structure. If you just read that book, I don't think it helps a lot. I think you read it and you read it and you read it and you go like, oh my. I read it. Now I read four paragraphs down and now I don't remember what was in the first paragraph. I kind of don't know the relationships of that. So part of a job of a teacher, part of what we do is we try to make those connections, right? So that, so that we give you a top down view of everything. Like when we do FARs, we don't read the FARs. We give you what's in the FAR and how it applies to airplane singles and land. And then from there, then when you go back and you read it, that at regulation in the evening, you begin to get clarity on it. You go like, oh, I see how it works now. So you can't just dive into this stuff uh, and expect to, to get it. And so I hope in the aerodynamics section, when you go back and you're able to do that, I think that that would, uh, that would, that would be the best, the best approach. And then you can take from there, there'll be some extra things in there, of course, and you can take from that. And, and uh, hopefully you'll seen the, uh, this video, you can get this video uh, on our member site. We only publish that on our member site, but I do want to have the teach free fly thing. Nick will send that out as a separate page. And then uh, let me just see if I have any, any questions here. Yeah, I'm trying to connect the dots, right? Yeah, thanks, Herb. And also thanks for your email I got today. Uh, this uh, building crash that was here in uh, Miami Beach wasn't really in Miami Beach, it's Surfside, but it's like one step away from Miami Beach. So neighbor, neighbor town, it's right up. And so that's kind of terrible that all happened. This building I'm in has been here since the 50s, so it ain't going nowhere. <laughs> it's been through a lot of hurricanes. So, and our building at WeWork has also been there a long time. So it was, a, it was an old parking garage before, and they designed those to survive hurricanes as well. So um, I think that's where I'm going to leave it. Uh, the next power hours, by the way, I, I just made a list of them. So let me just bring the one I can give you an example. So we're going to look at stalls and spins. Why you really, what you really need to know to stay safe. I'm going to talk about one of them is going to be an airline pilot's mentality. Do you have it? Uh, professional development. What's new and upcoming and what you need to get ahead of the ball, right? Uh, careful look at what you can do with your pilot certificate, commercial pilot certificate. There's new guidance now from the FAA on that. Uh, Cross-country flying across the USA. What skills do you need before you attempt such a thing? We'll have an interview with uh, what it's like to be a regional airline pilot. I'm going to interview a new hire, and I'm also going to interview someone who's done it for a while. So you can kind of get a, uh, you can take the rose colored glasses and see the whole thing, right? So, you know, it's, so the shiny jet always wins until it's your job, and then sometimes it don't win no more. Uh, but other times it stays a very good career. So I want to sort of explore that a little bit. I also want to talk about uh, finding a mentor as a new pilot and or a new CFI. So we're going to talk about how you find one of those and how that can save you like thousands of dollars and a lot of aggravation if you can find someone who, who can be like that. Uh, should you teach a student in round gauges or glass first? We're going to take an in-depth look at that. How to get a remote pilot certificate to fly drones. A pilot or not, here are the steps. Then Gary is going to do uh, in August autopilot pro tips. So the IFR guy that we uh, bring in. And we'll have some other guest people. And we're going to look at an in-depth look at some of our stuff and what, what things might help you. And then finally, I got a pilot deviation, which is basically the FAA is going to violate you, uh, what to expect, what to do, and uh, some good advice on that. If you don't belong to AOPA and don't have AOPA's legal services, you are absolutely crazy. So uh, that's the very, if you do nothing, you spend no other money today, go get that if you're a CFI. The pitfalls of being a new CFI. Yeah, yeah you know, also, I'm going to save the chat. So if you have uh, things that you would want us to talk about or go, uh, then, then send those to me. You can send it to Mike at CFIBootCamp.com. Or we also, uh, yeah, screen is not sharing. Okay. Then, um, yeah, it's just, I think this is me probably. So let me just put up here. So if you have other things that you would like for me to, to talk about or you think to be good topics, let, let's do that. I'm all for that. We always need new content. And I, I don't always need to be the one to direct the content. You know, it can be whatever we want to talk about. And if I don't know it, I'm pretty sure I can find people who do, right? I'm pretty well connected with, with all of that. So I think with that, I'm going to have to say see you later because I got shit to do. And uh, we'll talk to you next week. <laughs>